There you are. Okay. This is very round. Um, this is the final session. Um, I know that you're all eager to go and talk, of course. Um, and we have uh, a great deal of work to do here. I'll explain to you what we will be doing in the next uh, two hours. We will not go beyond two hours from now, because now it's two, um, 10 past two already. So we'll conclude by 10 past four. Uh, so I ask everyone to be concise and disciplined um, because a lot of people will have a lot of things to say. They're all important, and for that reason, you also have to be uh, concise in expressing yourself so as to be fair to others. Uh, what someone called earlier, have shared responsibility. I believe that's the main theme. Uh, so what we'll do is the following. First, each of the chairs of the panels will attempt to summarize their own panel, not only their opinion, but what um, 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 occurred in their panel, the gist of the discussion uh, that happened in their panel, and this will be by order of the panels. So uh, we will have the board walk, uh, Monty Marshall, Andrea Batoli, and Sherry Rosenberg, each of them will speak 10 minutes, uh, not more than 10 minutes. Uh, following that, we will pause for a moment, reflect, and then we'll move to the next phase. And in the next phase, we will have a more free-ranging discussion of a related issue, which I understand may be the main theme of a future workshop. Is that right, Yuda? Uh, on comparative genocide. And for that, uh, we had planned to have uh, Donald participate in that. He's written extensively on that, but he had to go to the airport. So we'll have the other two uh, presenters, uh, Frank and Barbara. Each of them, uh, thanks to Donald's absence, will have 15 minutes to speak if they so desire. Uh, I may have a few words to say myself, and then we will open this up to discussion. So that's the order of the day. Uh, and without further ado, um, I pass this to Deborah. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Omer, and thank you all. Um, thank you for this wonderful symposium, and thank you to all the participants for your strained patience as we proceeded through each of the sessions. So it is my task to sum up our the first session and it seemed to me that certain themes emerged w some of which repeated over the days that followed one had to do with building up a body of knowledge how do we know what we know what about uh, the importance of languages um, the importance of different kinds of sources uh, how do we protect sources came up yet just now um, what is the, what do different sources tell us and how can they be appropriately used for whatever narrative it is that we seek to tell at that particular moment. So if we're writing on subject A, we need a certain kind of source. If we're writing on subject B, a different source and how can, um, the different uses of different sources, sorry for being so inarticulate on that subject when we're talking exactly about words. Um, okay, the next is about empathy. The empathy of the scholar. And this, that's quite all right. Um, this led to rather a long discussion over these past days about the virtues of thick, description of focusing on the individual versus taking a larger view. And then came the question of, should we be thinking of these as polars, or should we be thinking about this as, in relation to each other? How is it that we can go from the singular to the large, but also how is it that we can go from the large to the individual? How is it also that we can connect what happened in the past or what is happening at the present with the reader, 
with those whom we seek to reach. So I think that um, I think that might be where I would want to stop for now. Those were the main themes and issues that emerged from our panel that, as I say, followed through in the panels in the, in the, in the days that succeeded. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> in the panel we just had this morning, we were discussing the possibilities and obstacles. Sorry in preventing mass violence. And in that context, we started out with a discussion of international criminal justice and prevention, and then moved on. And I'll go on in a minute. The main themes really in terms of international criminal justice were certainly a discussion about its skeptics, the issue of justice versus peace, the issue of the legitimacy of the court, in particular because of geopolitics and the power balance, and the fact that only you know, certain individuals from certain countries will be brought to dock just because of the nature of things. It's unlikely that any of the superpowers will actually sit in the dock. Um, those were probably the two main uh, concerns in respect of international criminal justice. Um, there were then two recommendations given by one of the participants that in terms of prevention, the office of the prosecutor and the court itself should consider focusing more on incitement to genocide, which is an inchoate crime in and of itself. And then of course the um, challenges around defining incitement to genocide were then discussed and the distinction between incitement and hate speech and how do you draw the line and who would you prosecute again bringing us back into the challenges of the International Criminal Court sitting within a, you know, in the moment in our geopolitical structure that exists. Um, then we discussed uh, uh, briefly military intervention for humanitarian purposes, uh, just war doctrine, and, um, and then we talked more broadly, I think the final thing would be sort of prevention more broadly, and where are we? we as a community of individuals, to the extent those of us sit in that community of individuals that are interested in or work on, we're all interested in, I would say, but those who work specifically on prevention of mass atrocities, where, where has that agenda gone? Um, some suggested, and that was what I think was um, fantastic about this meeting in general, I have to say, there was no term that could be used that was not left unchallenged. Every term was challenged, in a, in, but in a fantastic way that forced everyone to think deeper. And I, I, I personally enjoyed it. So some persons talked about how the prevention agenda in terms of the prevention of mass atrocities has actually in the past 10 to 20 years or so in the last two decades has actually progressed. There's been progress. And then that, that use of that term and the idea that there had been progress was challenged, which, which then, you know, we had um, a further and a deeper discussion about what that means. And I think that was essentially the gist of the, this morning's conversation. Thank you. My turn. <clears throat> okay. All right. I'm not going to be quite as brief but I'm hopefully, hopefully will be just as succinct. Uh, my task was to uh, talk about what's being done in uh, quantitative research to help us understand uh, the nature of the problem of genocide and where are we at given the knowledge that we're gaining through these efforts uh, on preventing uh, genocide. So. In, in doing that, uh, there's some things I, th I think I need to rehash, and I'll, I'll do so with a series of bullet points. Um, the, the main issue is that we have a, a problem that we're interested in knowing about, but we have to situate it in the context. And the context is globalization and complexity. And we need to uh, factor in the whole system to understand how the parts work together, and not only how things come about, but how we can change the course of events. Uh, in doing so, we have to look at different levels of analysis because these types of activities ha uh, occur 
in different places. The one thing that we do know about them is that uh, these extreme events, these mass atrocities, these genocides, these mass killings, don't occur spontaneously in peaceful societies. So that they occur almost invariably, and I would say invariably, uh, in situations of political turmoil, instability, and very, very often under the cover of warfare. Um, I described an 18-year uh, effort by the United States government to better understand the structures and dynamics uh, leading to the risk of instability because from a prevention point of view, if genocide is a secondary consequence of political instability in armed conflict, then to prevent the genocide, our first course is to prevent uh, the condition that breeds uh, the problem. And so we need to know about uh, what uh, uh, brings on the onset of political and civilian warfare. Uh, we talked about a risk analysis, um, the, the conditions under which these uh, conditions, uh, these uh, problems occur, early warning, uh, our ability to anticipate uh, the onsets of these events, looked at trends analysis to see if we were doing better or worse, over time, uh, policy evaluations to see what we can do and whether that's effective in doing what we would like it to do. And, of course, under the rubric of, of the intervening uh, problem of uh, promoting the national interest, uh, when we have 198 nations in the world, all with very particular national interests, how do we come to a common understanding of a common problem and work collectively uh, with that problem? Uh, talked about policy imperatives of promoting and defending globalization. That would be the U.S. national interest because the U.S. is behind this effort. Uh, but the U.S. In interest, I, I would argue, is anticipating problems and improving responses to those problems. Major findings of the effort are derived from extensive and intensive empirical research uh, in a broad collaborative uh, effort involving scholars, analysts, and policymakers. And what we've learned, I'm going to uh, say six things. First, principles of, uh, principal risks of political instability are only five. And these are common to all countries. This is, an, I think, an enormously made, uh, important finding. Uh, second, poorer and lesser co developed countries are the conditions under which these types of problem events are most likely to occur. Multi-ethnic societies are at risk but only when the state is actively involved in discriminating against one of its constituent groups. Autocratic governance is strongly associated with the onsets of violence, uh, whereas incomplete democratization is susceptible to autocratic blacksliding, which uh, secondarily increases the risk of armed conflict once they've backslid to autocratic rule. Societal polarization is the principal dynamic factor leading directly to political instability, and this process of mobilization takes time. We can identify the players, and this period is characterized by voice, and this plays into uh, some of the later panels. Whereas we have ample early warning of the trajectory of conflict events because the actors actively um, demonstrate and articulate uh, what their interests are in, the, in, in these political disputes. Sixth, uh, the most extreme forms of political instability create conditions of inhumanity that include the real potential of genocide, mass atrocity, and mass killing. Uh, I went on to explain that uh, the development of these models and several associated models uh, is ongoing, that the U.S. government is extremely interested in this and finds it very useful that it has expanded this effort uh, and it expends an enormous amount of money because the U.S. has global interests. The U.N. Would, uh, should have an appropriate interest in this kind of work and we've taken this to the U.N. and we've talked with them. But there are political prohibitions against the U.N. getting involved in this kind of work, mainly because the units of analysis are member states and member states have a veto over how the U.N. treats them as objects of analysis. And so there's a great deal of um, uh, barriers uh, to them doing this. They're very sensitive uh, to the problem. They're very interested in the issue, but their effort has lagged. Uh, 
Um, but they're, they're increasing their interest. And I think they're increasing with uh, the advent of the R2P uh, principle, uh, seeing an imperative that they need to get involved in these issues. Uh, Barbara Harf had uh, talked about uh, the specific indicators of uh, uh, risk uh, indicators of genocide, and these are seven uh, ruling ethnic minority, uh, prior genocide or politicide in that particular uh, country, exclusionary ideology espoused by the ruling groups, autocratic regime in control, uh, low trade openness or remoteness, isolation from, from the greater uh, human collectivity, uh, history of instability, and uh, state-led discrimination, many of the same factors that we find um, general to uh, political instability. Uh, finally, uh, the discussion that ensued uh, was uh, very rich, uh, and there were several themes uh, that came out of this, uh, very, uh, a lot of questions, of course. But the themes that uh, I uh, uh, jotted down was, uh, number one, what does effective conflict prevention look like? If we are getting better at this, if these models are actually working, how do we know they're working? Uh, how do we know we're, uh, the, the, the policies that we're implementing is ha are having any effect? Um, I argued that we can track these things over time, and I showed uh, several pieces of evidence that indeed things are improving. Uh, what is the role of intervention, and how do self-interested interventions affect conflict outcomes? This is, this is a key question that's almost impossible to answer at, at present. We've been working on this. I don't have an answer to this, but uh, it is a problem. In general, I, I pointed out that unilateral interventions are, are always problematic that you multilateral interventions are more likely uh, to have a positive effect on outcomes. And the last point, you have two minutes left? Oh, I should keep talking. <laughs> uh, do democracies act democratically when acting globally? I mean, this was, uh, I think, a, a, a key question, and it kept coming up in, in many of the, the uh, people's comments. And, uh, of course, this relates to the issue of intervention and what types of interventions and what the expected outcomes would be and what goals we're pursuing uh, by uh, trying to get involved in, in um, uh, influencing the outcomes of political processes. Um, I made the observation, because I do uh, look at the problem of democracy and qualities of governance in all countries of the world, and as I do come from the United States, I will freely admit that democratic countries do not necessarily act democratically when dealing with other countries. And we could measure this, and if I wasn't working for the U.S. government, I would do that, but as they pay my way, I, I, I hesitate to bite the hand that feeds me until after they stop feeding me. Uh, having failed to prevent, uh, when did genocide stop? Do we have any information on on the internal processes of these genocidal events. Uh, can we tell where, what trajectory they're taking, how bad they will get, how far they will spread, what causes them to stop? And we really don't have any uh, responses. It was brought up that two things uh, contribute to the ending of genocide. One is that the genocides burn themselves out for some reason. That genocides never completely kill the target population. That the, they stop when enough of the target population is eliminated until the political, th the perceived political threat, is uh, dampened. Uh, the other one is an intervention to stop it, and we only had two examples. Uh, one was the Vietnam intervention in Cambodia and the Tanzanian intervention in Uganda. Thank you, Monty. Andrea. <laughs> I have many friends. <clears throat> One of them is <clears throat> is O. I don't want to say the name. Still alive. And was young. Young enough to not be a threat, old enough to carry messages. And so one day, the armed group came and said to O and his family, you need to carry a message. 
and ask the older brother of all to kill the father first, the mother second, the youngers, and then they ask all oh, to kill this brother. Then they say to all, you go back to the others, to the village, and tell them what we do if they don't do what we ask them. It took all many years before he could speak again. His grandmother took him in. He was loved by a community larger than his own family, and lived in one of the countries of the Great Lake region that we spoke about in our panel. Those who were perpetrating this were led by somebody who is now indicted by the International Criminal Court. You can say the story many ways. You can say, it happened the other day. It's still happening. The world in which we live is really bad. It's a terrible one. Or you can see the story. Humans have been doing this forever. This is not a modern invention. But what we have today, we didn't have yesterday. We have a sense as a human family that this is wrong, that this shouldn't happen that those who do that should actually be persecuted, should be brought to justice. That justice for us collectively calls for a response of everybody, not just of all, not just of his family, not just of his ethnic group, not just for a revenge, but for something bigger, stronger, better, that involves all of us. So when I heard a few years ago, a Tanzanian ambassador that was the Secretary General of the International Conference of the Great Lake Region, a great woman, her name is Liberata Mula Mula, saying to an assembly of African leaders, we own this problem. We have to respond to these problems. Violence, political violence, use of political violence cannot be explained only because of someone else. I felt a leap in my heart and in my mind. I said, humanity is moving in the right direction. Many, even in our panel, said, but that's bullshit. It doesn't really change. The calculus of the powerful one are still in favor of killing people, in favor of manipulating, in favor of threatening, in favor of smuggling arms, in favor of so much that... Does anybody have a cell phone? Can you raise your hand? Very good. We are all involved. As some in the panel explain, the material that do your cell phone comes from there, and many of those who are involved in the violence are actually profiting from our buying cell phones. So welcome to the world in which we are. You can say, well, you know, the Great Lake region is far away. It's far away culturally. He's far away geographically, he's far away historically. Or you can say, he's actually my own backyard. He's my own humanity. I'm connected to it not only because I buy a cell phone, but because I hear the story of all, but because the world in which I want to live is a world in which those things should not happen. So I think that when we together gather and thought about the Great Lake region, we approach this with a great sense of trepidation. This is the place where humans have killed humans in the last period more intensely. And yet it is from that region that we hear genocide no more. We, want, we, we heard it, Yehuda and many others, we heard it very strongly. We want to move the region from a genocide prone to a genocide free region. I said, I want to join. I can do this little much, I can come to Jerusalem, I can ally myself with Yehuda Bauer, and we can make a little progress. I prefer a little progress than the cynicism of saying there is nothing can be done. I prefer to do a little progress 
and believe that the story of O is good enough for me to use what I have, my connection, my intelligence, my classrooms, my new friends, to make this a little less probable tomorrow. I am with you. It's not over yet. But why not positioning ourselves on the side of those who are saying, not this way, not now, not that much? Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, and thank you to all of you. Uh, this last uh, summary, or rather, I would say, uh, exhortation um, was uh, moving, so it's, um, it's a little hard to move on from here, particularly because you remind me of a number of stories, similar stories from other historical contexts using the same kind of techniques, uh, so it brings back. A great deal. What I, what I will do now, since uh, my co-panelists have been so extraordinarily disciplined, is the following. I'm, I'm going to uh, raise a few issues. I'm not going to debate them, just to raise a few issues that I think may be pertinent to our discussion. And I'll let uh, at least the two of you, if you would like, uh, to respond because you've taken so little time. And if uh, also Monty and Andrea would like to say a couple of words. And, and then I'd like to open this up so that we have some time for an exchange with the audience, okay? Um, and I'm going to do this rather uh, quickly. My, my first and most general question is, uh, especially to the panelists, is in what way do you think the panels that you were chairing and the issues that you were debating were related to the other panels and the other discussions? Can you point out one, two, three main issues. Not the, the, the general theme is, of course, the same theme, but more specific issues that you can see how they relate to each other. Somewhat more specifically, because this was raised earlier, uh, and I was curious, we didn't debate that uh, at length, what, what do you think would be the meaning of shifting from the term genocide, which we know is problematic, and at the same time, we also acknowledge was a major innovation, uh, a term given to a crime without a name, as uh, Lemkin called it. For moving from that to such terms as massacre, crimes against humanity, war crimes, uh, extermination, and so forth, not only what are the benefits, but what might be the costs of, of doing that. Uh, next, what, what would it mean? Because I'm sorry, could you just, I'm sorry, could you just yes. frame the second one. Moving from using the term genocide, which we acknowledge is problematic, particularly because of its definition, to other terms such as massacre, uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes, extermination, all of these terms that also exist in the, in the international legal context and existed before genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the cost of doing that? Mm -hmm. uh, third, We've spoken a great deal about genocide prevention and recognize the difficulty of, of um, saying what it means and then implementing that. Uh, we haven't spoken about war prevention. And it's not a term that's used as much. At the same time, I think we all acknowledge that genocide almost invariably happens within the context of war, or under the cover of war, uh, or itself masquerades as war. And so what here is the relationship between war prevention and genocide prevention? Um, it seems, and that's related to my previous question, because it seems like there's a relationship between these two. What then do you think would be, and, and that's something that troubled me in the, earlier this morning, um, can we say that on, on some level, and I'm, I'm, I'm not being cynical at all, but that on some level, the legal framework that has been, that we discussed in the previous panel, in Sherry's panel, um, and that has become more elaborate and more established and, and has progressed, uh, and, and yet m may uh, m not be accomplishing what it set out to accomplish, can it at some point be serving as a cover rather than as a prevention? Um, that is that when you create something and yet it doesn't work, what, what, what does it do to the phenomenon that it's trying to prevent? Uh, does it, can it create a sort of moral discourse 
that makes us more comfortable in thinking about an event that in fact is going on because we have a framework to talk about it. Uh, and that's something that troubles me, and it, it is in the relationship between practice and moral discourse, between events on the ground and what we would like them to be, rather than in actually making a change. Um, um, Should we start with that? Yeah, okay. And Go then, ahead. And then you Go jump ahead. right yeah. back in Go to, uh, to give yes. us other things to worry about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Okay, so I, uh, I chaired the first panel, which was about the, whether the Holocaust should be a paradigm um, in, for the study of other genocides. And what we talked about was the way in which the Holocaust, you, that using the Holocaust as a paradigm can be useful, but it also can blinker our view, meaning that we, lo we look at the landscape only along one lens. But it also, we also talked about the way in which looking at a landscape through the lens of the Holocaust, we may well misread the landscape we are seeing. So it's not just about directing our view, it's about not interpreting correctly everything that is there to be seen. So from there, we talked then about the role of politics, and these relate to the questions that you raised, Omer, but just not in the exact language of them. So then we talked about the role of politics, the role of politics in Holocaust education, the role of politics, and then going to Omer's question about how were, were these were issues that were raised there at that panel brought forward in the following panels, the role of politics in decisions to intervene, but also in decisions just to sit on our hands. And then comes this question that you raised last, which is all about screens. Over the past couple of days, I have been struck by the number of screens. And one of those screens has to do with institution building, which also we discussed on our very first day. Um, we talked about the institution building of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, we have one at Clark University. My suggestion was the founding of such a center here in Israel. Um, and, the, and screens that are, that are thrown up to deflect attention from, from that enterprise. But what we also followed in the days that came were different kinds of screens over and over again to deflect our attention. So, talking about institution building, um, the, the, the ICC, the different task forces, someone also ha gave the suggestion of founding an ICC-related police force. So all of these are institutions. They may well be useful institutions, but they may well also be institutions that focus our attention on those issues and the issues that are being discussed at that court, on that tribunal, and, or on that project, and not on what's actually happening on the ground. So that was a sense that I had repeatedly over these days, was this question of screens that we, or um, that we establish to avoid dealing directly with what is happening. Another is this idea about shifting from genocide to other terms. I guarantee you, if we move to another term, whether it's um, war crimes or atrocity, we will have, we, um, it will engender new debates. People say, is that really an atrocity? How do you judge atrocity? How many? What, what are the boundaries of that term? Please define what you mean by it. And 
I genuinely believe, and I genuinely may be wrong, but I genuinely believe that changing the terminology will not solve the problem that we now have. So my, my last, I, I suppose my last point would be, would have to do with positionality of the researcher. And that issue came up again several times, um, and that has to do with our self-consciousness as researchers as to where we stand in the world, how we are viewing the problems we are studying, the biases that we bring to it, and the um, going back to what I said earlier, the evidence that we use to deal with it. So if I was brief before, I was long now, and so I will stop. Thank you. Sorry? Not more than five minutes. Not more than five minutes. Okay. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for the excellent questions, which in some way sort of provide their own answers. It kind of sums up a little bit some of the major themes, really, in the questions themselves, so I appreciate them. Um, on the first point of some of the themes that you can see running through the different um, conversations that we had, um, I agree, or I perceived uh, similar themes to Deborah, perhaps in slightly different ways, but certainly institution building from day one about building an institution for Holocaust and genocide studies in Israel to the, you know, this morning's discussion about um, international criminal tribunals and other mechanisms to the conversation um, about the Great Lakes region and the International Conference on the Great Lakes. So certainly international institution or in institution building. Another theme that I saw running through is assisting society, sort of this tension between looking at the institutions, looking at the mechanisms, stepping back from the ground view um, a little bit in order to sort of generally build these institutions. And then I think Kathy did a really good job of always bringing us back a little bit to the concrete. So when we talked about international criminal tribunals, I appreciate that Kathy brought in, well, let's, let's talk about what exactly was happening in Srebrenica while the international uh, community was trying to help. Um, so we were always brought back to what does it mean to assist societies. Um, finally, language and empathy, and I think that's been discussed enough, and I think it's a fabulous point, and it runs through not only our position as researchers, but our position as, you know, judges, lawyers, advocates, anybody dealing with these issues in a sense of empathy. Um, for me personally, I'll just have to say that a sense of empathy as to what it means in Israel to create a Holocaust and Genocide Studies Center. Um, and the complexities around that issue here, I gained a, an empathy toward that situation that I didn't have before. And then I just, I just want to talk, I'm not going to, for a minute about, um, I would agree, about conflict prevention, um, preventing war and preventing genocide or atrocities. And just to say that these can act at cross purposes, there's no question about that. And there can be, and we've seen a tension between conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and atrocity prevention. And there are people who understand that this needs to be better understood if not resolved. And many suggest that conflict prevention and resolution aim toward a neutral and stabilized outcome among combatants or potential combatants, and that pursuing those goals of um, conflict resolution can conflict with atrocity prevention. And the, prevent, and the protection of populations, namely, you know, accountability and deterrence. And there's no question that these two conflict, and it needs to be better understood. Um, I guess finally, if I have one more minute, um, I agree. I don't, I've been engaged in this conversation about shifting from the use of the term genocide to crimes against humanity or mass atrocities. David Sheffer, who was brought up, I think, uh, earlier this morning, who's been an advocate for using atrocity crimes, he makes a distinction. And I think what he was trying to get at was that for the purposes of, of politics, really, for trying to get politicians to act, we need to just say atrocities. If we say genocide, we up the ante politically, and we may not get any action. For that purpose, we should use atrocity. And then when we get to the courts, it's still a crime. It can still be prosecuted as genocide. Bill Shabas then comes in to say, and I think he's thinking more in terms of when we bring it to the court, just say crimes against humanity. You'll, he, was, he was a prosecutor. You'll get the conviction on crimes against humanity. It's harder to prove genocide. You don't need it. I think that those are good points, but ultimately, again, if you're thinking in terms of, of ex-ante prevention, it's really not the issue. I think the issue is that it's a legal category. 
And any time you have a legal category, you're going to have a, a significant debate about, well, what is it? You're going to have the lawyers in the State Department or whatever these departments all around the world saying, we don't know if we have the crimes, we don't know if we do anything. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Monty, with your permission, since you used all your 10 minutes earlier, uh, just, just make a very brief comment because we do want to open this. <clears throat> I have to choose. But I can make four really brief comments. That's too long. Make, make two. <laughs> two. Well, can we negotiate three? <laughs> that's the issue, right? We're moving from force to negotiation. So that's my first point. <laughs> no, really. Uh, One of the issues common to the, the panel is education, and, and this is uh, where I applaud uh, Andrea and his uh, initiative. Uh, we need to increase understanding of the problem so that in the ideal we're acting in knowledge. We know before we act. When we act before we know, we create more problems. Uh, moving from genocide to other concepts, uh, we need to, you know, statistically, in order to not only, if we wait till it's a genocide, we can't act. So we have to understand lesser forms of mass violence in order to, to, to intervene more quickly. How many is that three? War and genocide. Uh, uh, the, in, uh, the prohibition of war began, as it was pointed out, uh, at the end of the Thirty Years' War in uh, 1648. It's taken us 300 years to institutionalize the general prohibition against war, but war still happens and genocide happens within war. How many years will it take? Um, lastly, and I know I've just made four points, and that's the point in negotiation. <clears throat> um, the legal structure, as, uh, what, what does it do? Uh, we have the marriage between legal structure and strategic behavior. Legal structure deals with normative content. The strategic behavior deals with instrumental actions. What we need to do is, is figure out a strategy that not necessarily is direct and, and straightforward, but we need to Im improve the compliance with the, the ethical and moral norms that legal structures are embodying. So in the process of doing this, uh, maintain reasonable expectations on, on progress. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea, also keep it short, please. Just to say that um, we didn't have the name. And the fact that we were given a name is a great gift. So as a human family, the fact that we can call this genocide, it's an important step. We need to use it well. And we actually need to preserve the use because it's very frequently misused. But there is one use that is very recent, that is actually here, even, even in this room, of young people, especially in the United States, now in Israel, in Europe, working out to prevent genocide. They are working with technology, they're working sending people, they are activists on the prevention of genocide. Well, you can say activists to prevent massacres, to prevent, but it just resonates with them. So there is a reason to keep the word, because the word was connected to a human experience that is very precise and at the same time very universal. Thank you. That's a fantastic point. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, force you to something that I hadn't uh, proposed before. What we're going to do now, we're going to release these four panelists, bring two more people, raise the issue of um, comparative genocide, and then open this up to a discussion where you can talk about both issues. Can I make a suggestion? Yes. Uh, Omar, I noticed there's some chairs on the side. Yes. I could bring two chairs next to you. Please, today. please. So people could remain where they are. Absolutely. Pass us the okay. okay, okay. So just, 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 just come over. Yeah. So as I said, we are now opening this up also to the future, since we're all very progressive and thinking about what will happen next. Uh, to comparative genocide, I'm not going to say anything but the fact that I spent several years uh, teaching a course uh, on comparative genocide. I, I didn't actually call it comparative genocide. I called it uh, modern genocide and other crimes against humanity. And I taught uh, a series of genocides. Um, and I found that to be both a very difficult experience. These were very large classes, too. There was extraordinary interest, at least at Brown, in this phenomenon. Um, but it was hard also, obviously, emotionally. 
it was hard to encompass all these events. Uh, it was often frustrating. Uh, we often also watched what was happening in the, in the, in the news. We had a very active web page. Um, and yet I, I remain convinced, having come to this after teaching the Holocaust for several years, that it is crucial to keep teaching and discussing this phenomenon, um, particularly um, in, in, in places where um, publics, students, academics, and politicians are focused on their own, on their own genocide, on their own tragedies, on their own victimhood, to be able to look and understand other cases opens people, students, scholars, to a better understanding of their own experiences. And doing it through that, I at least began to understand my own field and the, the things that I research very differently. Um, and, and from that point of view, n not only from prevention, um, which, which is the most important, obviously, and not only from, from the point of view of, 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 of a moral investment, which is uh, crucial, but also simply from the point of view of understanding, of understanding yourself. That is, in another way, saying um, empathy. <laughs> because if you can understand another genocide, not just feel it, but actually understand what happened, you can then go back to what you know better and you see that you did not quite understand it. So, so that's what I just wanted to raise. And now, uh, Frank? You want me to start? Maybe Barbara will start. I have a longer thing, I think. So Wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> then let me start. Fifteen minutes. Yeah, it'll be fifteen minutes. I apologize to those of you on my left. Um, I've been asked to speak a little bit about comparative genocide. Sorry. Can you hear me better now? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. About. No, it's fine. It's fine. No, I think it would be You want to stand up, Frank? You, you want to stand up there? No. I'll, I think it's probably. Well, well, let's see how it goes like this. You, I'm not. I see. I, I see what the problem is. He can't get me in the camera. Right, I'll move over here a little bit. This is all right. All right. Uh, I'll restart my time with the permission of Omar. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go. <laughs> in uh, 1978. You could have put 10 people in a closed room, and those 10 people would have comprised the world's entire stock of what today we call genocide scholars. Many of them were Jewish. Many of them had come from families, were part of families, that had lost relatives during the Holocaust. Many of them were in the humanities and social sciences. And it was very rare to find a lawyer or any sort of uh, epidemiologist or demographer, etc., among them. We began out of a determination to try to understand not only why the Holocaust had happened, but also why the world had stood by as the Jewish people were slaughtered in Europe. And increasingly, as we became more aware of modern history, the Armenians and others. All of you who are Jewish and come from Eastern Europe stock hate to use that word, but come from families with their roots in Eastern Europe, know that your grandparents or great-grandparents read 40 Days at Musada, and that there was a culture that was just below the surface among East European Jewish families that were literate and read in many languages, which was aware of the fate of the North American native people, the fate of Aboriginal people, as they were called in Oceania, as well as 
the uh, impact of anti-Jewish actions and measures and laws on Jews in Eastern Europe. Yet, some of us decided that rather than focusing exclusively on the Holocaust, we would also broaden the horizon and look at other cases of what was called in the United Nations Convention of 1951, originating in 48 and back to 44, genocide. Why did we do it? Why did we move into this area that today we call comparative genocide studies? Well, first of all, some of us, I was not one of them, but my colleague Kurt Jonasson was, came from a gymnasium education in Germany, in Köln, where they studied ancient history, and they knew a little bit about the history of the annihilation of some people's such as the Carthaginians. They also, in their knowledge of Jewish liturgy and Jewish history, knew about what happened in places like Regensburg and others in early modern Europe. And they knew that some elements that were embedded in the Holocaust could be found much earlier in human history. So the search, and it was a quest, I want to emphasize that, it was a search, but it also had a kind of quest component. We were searching for answers to the question, why do human beings decide to annihilate in whole or in part the members of a human group, politi I'm sorry, racial, religious, national, or ethnic, as the convention defines the groups that are protected under the convention, but also political and social because we recognized how amorphous some of the boundaries were. What were our aims? Our first aim, through understanding, through research, through analysis, was prevention in the future. And that biased us in a certain way. In a sense, we were looking for a usable past, which always has its pitfalls. But it also has its merits. And we thought if we could identify what were the factors that emerged before genocide, when they could still be interrupted in their evolution towards genocide, whether they were societal functional elements, systemic elements of various sorts, or individual very idiosyncratic factors, we could learn enough to save lives in the future. We also wanted to know about when it was appropriate and when it was possible to intervene effectively to stop genocides that were underway after they had started. And finally, what could be done after genocide to help survivors heal themselves, to build bridges between survivors of the Holocaust to survivors of the Armenian genocide to survivors of other cases of genocide who still were alive, and to create a kind of solidarity that would build alliances across groups that would be far more powerful through synergistic interaction than any one group standing by itself all over the world. So we wanted to build the Genocide Internationale. We had to define genocide not only using the legal definition of Article 2 of the Genocide Convention and the elements of the crime of genocide in Article 3, and in those days we didn't even know those words, even though they existed already, we had to also develop a kind of social science definition of the boundaries which would determine which cases we looked, like, looked at. And I don't know if Yehuda Bauer remembers our meeting in New Haven, Connecticut, 
in about 1984 when he came to give a major talk at a conference on Holocaust education. But it was the same day we signed the contract with Yale University Press for our book on the history and sociology of genocide that is whose manuscript went in in 1989 and was published in 1990. And Yehuda and I stood on the side of the meeting and spoke for a few minutes. And Yehuda had some legitimate concerns. As an already well-established and continuing to develop historian of the Holocaust, he said, well, I don't know. I'm not sure where this is going to go. And he expressed the concerns, which were not only current then, but are still current, among survivors of the Holocaust and the survivors of other cases of genocide. Would we wind up, by comparison, trivializing the Holocaust? Would we wind up so flattening the canvas or the terrain and uh, ridge map that no one genocide would stand out, not only as paradigmatic, we didn't talk about that, but stand out in a way that you could really understand individual genocides in the same terms and usefully. Well, that was our challenge. We had, a, Kurt Jonasson and I had already started a course in 1980 and we were about four years into teaching it. So we felt we could do it and that's why we proposed the book to Yale. And we went back to ancient history, to early modern history, to modern history, all over the world, in every culture. And our premise was, based on the history we already knew, I studied African history, American history, etc., that every people, every national group possessed, every human being possessed the capacity under, the, under certain circumstances to engage in genocide commission, as well as to defend people against genocide. That this was a human capacity for good and for evil, to use theological but also philosophical terms. We are still learning. What are the benefits of comparison as opposed to the excellent road of specialization. Yeah, I have, according to my watch, Omar, I have five minutes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So we're on the same uh, synchronization. We'll go over the top in five minutes. Okay. First of all, we were interested in ed education, in public education about this phenomenon, this process, and its consequences, its meaning for how far we had to go until we became, using the Enlightenment term, fully civilized as well as enlightened. It was very clear from the beginning that in many cases there was research, but it was done without any reference to genocide. So the people who studied the history of the Mongol expansion and Mongol civilization, etc., never used the concept of genocide when they looked at Genghis Khan's treatment of people who resisted. The people who studied the Puritans never spoke about the annihilation of the Pequot people in 1637. Not even the people who looked at the annihilation of Christians in Japan in the same year 1637, ever applied the notion that maybe this was a genocide. We liaised with these people and began to bring them into a network of scholars that raised the question, was there more to the murder of the Christians of Japan was there more to the destruction of the Athenians in 416, I'm sorry, by the Athenians in 416 of the Melians after they resisted paying tribute to the Athenians than simply political and economic motives? Was there something else? Did it mean something, for example, as we found out later, that after the Athenians murdered all the 
Melian men, enslaved the women and children, dispersed them throughout the Mediterranean. They also destroyed all the Melian shrines on the island of Milos and banned the use of the name of the Melians, which is a pretty extreme form of eradicating a people from history. And it is hardly unique, I should add. So the research that we could do, the research our colleagues could do, began to come together and to form a cluster and eventually a critical mass that could connect, because there was some substance there, to the emerging legal developments in international criminal law, which had been paralyzed by the Cold War and needed to cross boundaries to cross-fertilize what we could learn. We started with research and education. We moved to, I mean all of us now, to advocacy and to active monitoring of events in countries that seem to be at risk of entering the genocidal process. After many years of teaching the subject, Personally, I made a decision to add a new course to my teaching portfolio, which I'm starting in two days or so in Montreal. And it's called Human Rights and Genocide Prevention in History. It's a course I could not have taught in 1980. Andrea Bartoli, in his eloquent comments, caught the spirit that moved me to propose to my colleagues this new course. It will not replace the course we started in 1980. It will be, I hope, an adequate complement to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a very hard act to follow, if I may say so. I came to Israel for the first time 25 years ago to present my newly minted data set on genocides and political mass murder, which I call politicide, to a number of Israeli scholars. This took place in Professor Charney's living room, and there he is. It spurred a lively discussion as to the uniqueness of the Holocaust and the merits of comparative analysis. We apparently came full circle. Fast forward to 1994 and the annual meeting of the American Sociological Association in Los Angeles. Thanks to William Ganson, the conflict scholar who was then president of the association, the study of genocide was one of the key themes at that conference. It was here that a very well-known sociologist, you know him probably, Seymour Martin Lipset, approached me and said, Tell me in five minutes or less how you define genocide. A phenomena that has too few cases to be of interest to a scholarly community that is focused on developing testable hypotheses and replication of findings. The 46 cases I had identified since 1945 did little to convince him. He was a representative of empirical researchers of the time. The behavioral revolution in the social sciences was less keen to deal with emotion-laden subjects, but instead emulated everything that could be learned from the hard sciences. That is, in order to develop and test theory, one needed data and statistical analysis. Here is the essence what, of what empiricists do. We search for patterns through so comparison of cases in order to generalize and specify hypotheses about causes and processes that can be tested systematically to be accepted, modified, or discarded depending on the results. We are considered the soft sciences because our explanations are probabilistic, not definitive. Because we are working with less than perfect material, that is human behavior. Let me be a little bit more specific. Though all social scientists agree that the goal is theory, 
questions remain, such as how do we arrive at it? In what form should it be expressed? And how do we test it? Social scientists use deductions and inductions to develop initial theory about the nature of social and political phenomena, both micro and macro political phenomena of interest, from nations, the international system, and ethnic groups, to individual voting choices and means of participation. In genocide research, many of us work across multiple levels of analysis because we ask multiple questions. For example, we may ask why do genocides happen mostly in autocratic societies and also why and how ordinary citizens become mass murderers. For my own research, I have argued that exclusionary ideologies such as fascist, communist, and extreme nationalism are lead contributors to the evolution of genocide. To test that hypothesis, I developed data for all countries in all years dating back to 1955. Statistical analysis showed that such ideologies preceded most genocides and politicized of the last 50 years. On the micro level, I asked whether increases in hate propaganda, the means by which these ideologies are propagated, accelerate escalation to genocide. Again, the answer was yes, based on complex statistical analysis. Of course, we need to be careful when we make inferences from one level of analysis to another. Thus, hate propaganda may not necessarily be rooted in an ideology proclaimed at the national level. Empiricists aim to discover common causes and processes from the specific rather than dabbling in grand, in grand theory. Historians, not so different from us, engage primarily in ideographic analysis, looking at the specifics and peculiarities of one or a few cases to explain what happened. Without that type of analysis, social scientists would be at a loss when we attempt to theorize about a number of cases. What I'm telling you is that comparison is essential to explanation and in the long run to prevention. However, comparison of cases alone do not generate explanations. It does generate theory, however. By comparison of cases, we typically observe regularities that can be generalized. But in essence, these are descriptions in need of explanations. Statistical analysis tells with a measurable degree of certainty what the relative importance of individual factors are in the onset of genocide. It is because of systematic global analysis that we know now which cases are high, at a high risk, Syria being a case in point. If you know more about what triggers escalation, here early warning is key, we could theoretically apply means that could de-escalate situations. Finally, to the uniqueness of the Holocaust. It is the goal of our community of genocide scholars to give the Holocaust its rightful, lasting place in the sad history of mankind. It is one of the most horrendous cases, if not the worst case in modern history, but not the only one. If we insist on its uniqueness, then it may well end up forgotten by those who want to forget. Comparison is not an attempt to trivialize events. To the contrary, it is a starting point in our attempt to understand and an essential step towards prevention. And some sorts on prevention. Very little more. I would propose that in high risk situations identified in risk assessment, routinely done now, we should focus on long term planning involving all measures of development aid, support for building the civil society institution, and providing good offices or any other strong third party commitment that has helped prevent or mitigate past humanitarian disasters. Moreover, we should always use both inducement and sanctions to promote cooperation. In situations where abuses need to be halted, states should support UN missions, not go it alone. A recent study by Peter Wallenstein and Berger Held concludes that more than half of all international peacekeeping missions in interstate conflicts since 1948 have been successful. And I end right here. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to the ex 
extraordinary discipline and succinctness of your presentations. We have plenty of time now for debate, and I'm opening this now to a general debate. Um, I, you may uh, present uh, questions and uh, points to all panelists, uh, both on genocide prevention and on the topics that were discussed throughout the conference. I ask you to be this, uh, succinct so that everybody gets a chance to talk and respond. So please. Yes, yeah, sir. And please uh, present yourselves. Is this a kind of fluke in human evolution? What, why did it happen? And uh, does that help us in any way to understand how to prevent it? Thank you. Uh, shall we collect a few? So That's a great idea. Let's, let's collect a few questions. Uh, a few more. Any, any other? Anyone? Uh, yes, please. Well, uh, it's not so much a, a question, a comment, uh, rather, about uh, what I've uh, heard. Uh, Comparative genocide has been my shtick for a number of years after the USA. I taught uh, graduate courses on comparative genocide at, uh, at, at Brown, at Concordia, at the University of California uh, in Berkeley, and then the University of Helsinki, University of Bordeaux, University of Antwerp, and so on and so forth. What I try to do with my students is to draw them out and try to bring them face to face with the human dramas, the horror unfolding along these genocidal landscapes. I use films. I would have liked to use uh, Lanzmann's uh, film, Shoah. Fortunately, that's a seminar that I showed, so I decided against it. But I use uh, a lot of films that uh, actually uh, Frank uh, uh, lent me, and uh, this was a very interesting way of, of a very uh, important way of uh, bringing out the human dimension, uh, the emotional dimension, as Deborah would say. But wh what I tried to do was to provide them with a, a, a grille de lecture, a kind of analytic frame, which would take into account uh, uh, the context, the motives, the agencies, the instruments, so that they could really stop reading into genocide a replica of the Holocaust this, to me, has been one of the most difficult things to do with students, to show them that not all holocausts, or not all genocides, are morality plays. That very frequently, uh, the violence is mutual. And then finally, I drew from my own experience of the Great Lakes to alert them to two dimensions of analysis that are seldom taken into account, the regional dimension. Holocaust is not just a domestic phenomenon. You look at what happened uh, during Holocaust, you look at, at Cambodia, you look at Armenia, you look at Rwanda, there's always a broader regional dimension that comes into focus and that ought to be taken into account. Unfortunately, we said very little of all this when we talked about the Great Lakes and Sudan, and frankly, I was quite, quite disappointed by the poverty of the empirical data brought to the discussion. The other major dimension is, uh, is, is regional, but local, really. And again, drawing from my own experience of Rwanda, it became immediately uh, clear to me, and then Scott Strauss uh, made this very, very clear, you cannot generalize about the mechanics of the killings in Kibungo, in Kigali, in Kiseni, you have all kinds of local arenas and this is really the uh, great merit of Scott Strauss, to uh, focus attention on this particular dimension. So uh, I'm sorry I didn't <laughs> raise any question 
But I wanted to share my thoughts with you on, on uh, my experience of teaching Chinese. Thank you, Renat. Uh, one, one more? Any, any other comments? Or should, should we respond? Uh, Jürgen? No? No? That's, that's a very quiet audience. Anyone there? Okay. Uh, so, please. So, I, so if you're still with us. <laughs> Uh, okay. On, on the matter of the origins of genocide and its relationship to uh, the development of ethnic groups over time, etc., um, we had the privilege of being in touch with uh, people like uh, Mary Douglas and others, uh, many uh, anthropologists and sociologists interested in early human societies, uh, those who, to be brief, uh, our view is that genocide arose as a human phenomenon around the time that organized agriculture developed and that it was the development of pastoralists raiding sedentary peoples to capture the harvest and to loot their cattle or whatever and take it away that produced situations in which the raiders from among the pastoralists sought to maintain tribute relationships with certain clusters of human beings and then discovered that among those dependents, there were rebellions against them when they came back to get the next harvest. And in order to create terror, the pastoralists eliminated as examples of what happened to those who resisted their demands for tribute, those, a certain number of the rebel communities and sought to disseminate, just in the way actually that Andrea described earlier in the case of O, to wider circles, and just as Genghis Khan did in his expansion and Shaka Zulu and others, the example of the fate of those who resisted. The magnet was the harvest. Pastoralists happened just to be the first people to exploit the human capacity to generalize and to see beyond what lay on the horizon and to think ahead. That's a very, very simple presentation of a very complex process and there are many reasons to put forward different theories, but I shan't do that now. I, ha I have another comment that is in a way more future-oriented and that has to do actually with Barbara's scholarship that in, it invites us to consider politicized as something that is relevant to genocide. And this is important because humans have this capacity, and, it, and it, it's increasingly so, to form new groups, new identities. So what if I start killing all the gays, all the homosexual? What if I start killing women? What if I start killing groups that are not ethnic in nature? And I think that this is actually happening more than people realize. And I think that it's an important distinction because I think that uh, what we are becoming aware is that when you kill not just one person but a group, you are not killing only uh, the potential of one. You are killing the construction of reality that is associated with that group. Well, this is very clear, for example, on uh, cultures. Uh, there are uh, cultures that are disappearing or disappeared. We have no more words. We have no, no those experiences anymore because nobody is able to relate them. That makes all of us weaker. That makes all of us as human system weaker. This is why I think we, need, we must move in a direction of an ecological approach where prevention is actually essential to our own capacity to survive. If, I'm, if I may, I'll, I'll just use my microphone here. Just, just two, two points. Um, 
One is Rogers Brubeck, uh, the sociologist whom some of you I'm sure know, uh, has written on ethnic group, on, on ethnicity and groupism, and has made a distinction between the two, um, arguing that, that ethnic groups are not an existing phenomenon, but one that is created. Um, and I, I recommend that as part of this uh, uh, seeking the, the roots or causes of uh, this kind of ethnic violence. He also wrote a really interesting book on a town uh, called um, uh, Koloshvar or Cluj, uh, trying to find why in that town, which has Hungarians and Romanians living side by side, they're not killing each other. They've actually managed to live next to each other, which was a very interesting ethnic study. One other point? One, one, one point? Um, on, on what uh, René was saying, I, was, I, I just wanted to add that I had a very um, strong reaction to uh, what he said because I had confronted precisely the same issue. That is, the genocide is often studied and taught, and the Holocaust in particular, as an issue of identity and not an historical event. And I have uh, tried as much as I can and learned a great deal from teaching comparative genocide to talk about that and to insist on it being an historical event to be analyzed and not one in which you find your, yourself reading it as something that tells you something about yourself, but first of all studying it as something that happened to others elsewhere. Um, you said? I just want to just note. Buzz. Um, I to to the so can you hold on one sec, Buzz? Okay. There's a response by Barbara, and then okay. we'll... I simply have to say one thing. Since I voted a little bit on ethnic uh, identity or so, we use the term communal groups rather than ethnic groups today. I think that's a better designation. Uh, it's a little bit more complex, uh, but ethnic groups kind of an old-fashioned way to describe uh, you know, these kind of groups. Also, when you think of perpetrators sometimes targeting certain groups, some groups don't really have a reality. Um, perpetrators designate who they are, in essence. Uh, they may not be a real group altogether, so that happens too. Okay, you can't group them anywhere. They're not an ethnic group, they're not a racial group, they're an identity groups uh, fabricated by potential perpetrators. Last, please. So, um... I want to touch uh, really, really short, <laughs> two, three minutes. On two, three minutes on three things. <laughs> so first, I want to raise also things that Christoph, uh, with your permission, has uh, we dealt with in the working in the first session, um, which, it, according to which, actually a lot of the current picture that we have about the Holocaust in current Holocaust research is quite partial, and in some cases even wrong, I would say. Um, and, and I'm saying this, uh, first of all, in order to give a, a sense of how much we have to go forward yet, but also to ask about comparative uh, pursuits, because I, I, I still think that uh, not only concerning the Holocaust and certainly about other cases, we still have a lot of particular work to do case studies about different genocides, but actually about different regional case studies and local case studies of, of genocide before we can actually really um, you know, do comparative uh, work uh, which would be really meaningful, especially if the goal is such a noble one as prevention. Um, and this brings me to, you know, after all the question is how do we move forward? Uh, so for an optimistic comment after, you know, organizing this event and also sitting in the, in the debates in the last three days, I think that the fact of having this event, this symposium in, here in Israel, and th this kind of public event itself, is, 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 you know, returning to some of the things that we've talked about in the last panel, progress, uh, uh, at least slight progress. Uh, but also I think that we need to understand that moving forward concerning Holocaust studies, only about the Holocaust, because we're in Israel now, uh, deals with incorporating broader, uh, a broader picture, broadening our lens, incorporating genocide and mass violence because in the Holocaust itself, like we've discussed in the first uh, session, uh, there are interrelated layers of violence that interact together where persecution and destruction of other groups was related on the same time on the same territory to the destruction and persecution of other groups. So, and, so I, I think that uh, 
for my first point about the status, uh, state of uh, Holocaust research, this kind of closes a circle, and maybe there is some progress here. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, take take the mic, please. Looking at what I am now hearing, I am, on one hand, impressed and somewhat, indeed, overwhelmed by the sophistication and analysis of many of the statements I'm now hearing. I am wondering whether they are becoming too sophisticated and too complex. Uh, looking at uh, everything I'm hearing from the perspective of intervention and prevention in public health, we always like to simplify and decomplexify the issue in order to make those interventions, uh, to uh, develop those interventions which break the chain of transmission at a critical point and simplify things. I remember arguments like this about the causes of road deaths and accidents 35 years ago. They took us nowhere uh, until a group of epidemiologists began to simplify a set of packaged interventions and to say these interventions directed at this component or that component or at this stage or that phase having to do with the vehicle, the occupant, the road, uh, or whatever, uh, either to prevent or minimize the severity or reduce the severity or uh, repair the consequences of the crash produced measurable results which could be evaluated through uh, evaluation of interventions which were either planned or unplanned such as what happened with the uh, famous story of the relationship between the raise and the, I'm sorry, the reduction in the speed limit following during the energy crisis, following the Yom Kippur War and the sudden drop in road deaths. Suddenly we had a striking cause-effect relationship discovered through a natural unplanned experiment which led to a series of very, very successful interventions. And so on it went with seat belts, airbags, uh, better roadside standards and so on and so forth. I would like to see changing a redefinition of the way in which we look at things in terms of the kinds of case studies with interventions tested either prospectively, which we cannot do, or through counterfactual history, what if, what if, and what if, using models based upon preventions that have and failures that have been shown to be successful or unsuccessful in the past and in the current, possibly with an attempt to project for the future. This is what has led me to the interest in incitement and its prevention in order to prevent its consequences. And I'm happy to hear, and I want to get a hold of that data that Barbara has across, across different, uh, on the comparative effects of incitement as a reproducible associated, I'm sorry, as a risk factor which shows, appears to be re reproducible across different cultures. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara? I think, uh, Elio, we are still at a pretty low level of, under, of understanding. So I think sophistication, eh, it's a relative term. Um, as far as um, response scenarios or conflict resolution, there's an excellent book by Bruce Gentleson. It details what the successes and failures were and looks at Macedonia especially as a success story. And we can really learn from that. And there's a lot of more work that needs to be done, especially on that level. We don't know, and I keep saying that over and over, what works and what type of situations at what time. I, I, I do believe that you are absolutely right, and this is where some of the, to you, to you, um, where some of the work is moving. Uh, when I'm saying that uh, in the Great Lake region there are people starting to, to think in those terms, um, I definitely hear what you're saying. And I think that it's important for us to realize that that kind of moment in, in a certain way requires um, a different use of knowledge or a different uh, uh, pragmatism that is uh, informed by knowledge previously acquired. So you, you change the, the road, you change the seat belt, you change the, the behavior because you understand and you have observed enough to understand what, it's, what is happening. And I think the, the fact that we, we got that far uh, is very remarkable. Yes, please. Uh, 
Yeah, we do. Yeah. Please. Uh, building on what um, Elihu had said and also what Renee said um, in general about his work, but also about Scott Strauss, uh, I'd like to um, suggest that we do look more at um, case studies in a very fine-grained way. Uh, the, um, I mean, the comparatives at the, at the level of data that are available are being done and done ably by many people here. Uh, but I'm aware of many situations that have not yet been described, even in my own experience, that I refer to anecdotally in lectures or I have a PowerPoint about it and I, I speak, and yet um, over time I'm thinking I should write this up. And yet it, it occurred when I was doing investigations looking for something else, but I noticed it and it has made a very big impression on me. And I think we, we should be asking each other um, as empirical researchers, but also instilling in students a sense that actually what is peripherally happening can be externally important in these contexts of crimes against humanity or genocide. So as, a, as an example, um, I haven't seen a write-up of the period of relative tranquility in Kosovo from the fall of 1998 until January of 1999, which is when Rambouillet happened and then there was a declarate, there was the, sort of the declaration of, uh, you know, this is the deadline and therefore the NATO bombing started. But from the fall of 1998 until January, so a short three months, there was the insertion of the Kosovo Protection Force. These guys were unarmed. Many of them were ex-military. There was some debate about what they did at night in terms of the women. Uh, but that was much more for KFOR, not this Kosovo Protection Force. They were primarily European, some American, um, orange vehicles and uh, certain kinds of uniforms. And they were there all over Kosovo, all over Kosovo, from about 6 in the morning till about 10 at night. And during the hours they were deployed, nothing happened in terms of Serbian predations on the coast of our population. They then went home at night. And the Serbs, the paramilitaries, and the formal forces learned immediately that they would do the killing at night. So you'd get up early in the morning in human rights investigation mode, and there'd be smoke coming from the hills. And you'd go into the villages, and the stories would be about what had happened at night. So first, I mean, there are many things you could draw from that. It has not been written up. Uh, and another thing that I've noticed, that, again, out of the Kosovo one, which has not been written up, how did the Serbs, under the cover of the NATO bombing, drive out everybody from the major cities of Kosovo, Pristina, Peja, all of them. They would start in the wealthy neighborhoods, which were usually on the hill, and they would commit some ghastly atrocity and leave the headless body or the three bleeding hands or the pregnant woman ripped up on the street. And this is a you know, civilized country where word could spread fast. And the terror that was evoked is you'd have this mass descent from the elites down the hill, basically, to every way out. They did this in all of the major cities, and they managed to empty, in you know, a period of under four and a half days, 800,000 people left Kosovo. Five days, maybe. So this way of how do you empty cities, big cities, I mean, not massive. So this is an example, two examples that come to mind from just one intervention that I've never seen recorded. And is this sort of intimate methodology of, of killing, but also of how you could suppress killing, that I think we should be paying attention to in for, terms of uh, comparative genocide, but also comparative prevention tactics. Thank you. Yes? One more brief comment. I, I'm not being privy to your deliberations. I don't know if I'm saying something you may have discussed already. But uh, Franco Fornari was a very important Italian psychoanalyst. And he wrote a book called Psychoanalysis de la Guerra, or Psychoanalysis of War, which came out about 40 years ago, a little more. And uh, his main point really was that uh, projection and externalization were the major Switch it mechanisms on. of, sorry, is this not working? Switch it on. It's on. It's on. There's a red light on. Just okay. Maybe another button. Maybe another button, too. Yeah, there are too many buttons. Uh, I'm that uh, so, uh, so the point was, for example, he gave the example of an African tribe where an important member of the tribe died, and at that point, the tribe was convinced that the other tribe, the, the neighboring tribe, had bewitched, had practiced magic, and had killed 
that particular person, at which point, this was of course fantasy, but uh, this fantasy was enough for them to go out and raid the other tribe and kill as many as they, can, as they could. Mm -hmm. So the point was that Fornari made, which I think is a impor very important point, and that is the unconscious process of externalization and projection, whether on the individual level or even more on the group level, is very important to understand why one group sets up upon another. Because in the opening lecture, we heard theories about why groups uh, decide to eliminate other groups, since they have also other choices. But here we have an unconscious explanation uh, of what, what actually happens. And I wondered if you had at all considered this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. This is not my field, but I am delighted to be able to speak on behalf of those who do work on it. Um, there is now a new emerging field called, indeed, the psychology of genocide. And the aim of these researchers is to understand exactly what you, what you allude to, which is what's up with those perpetrators? What do they see and what stories do they tell to themselves? But they also look at many other subjects like silence, the role of silence, and the causes for silence, as well as the breaking of silence. So they look at many different um, per, they look at many different perspectives, but really they're looking at many different individuals and their roles. Uh, and tr to try to understand the motivations and the best way to deal with these kinds of problems. So social, a new emerging field in social psychology, the psychology of genocide. Um, two recommendations in terms of works, uh, Irv Staub and James Waller. Uh, highly recommend that kind of literature. And I would add to that Johanna Volhart. Uh, one word on uh, what uh, Jennifer and Renée said earlier on studying the local. Uh, one thing that I, I've seen is that what seems to be missing to some extent is a comparative study of l local um, manifestations of genocide. Uh, if you look at certain manifestations of genocide in Rwanda, in Bosnia, in what is called in Polish-Ukrainian uh, lingo the, 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 the Volinian Massacre uh, and the Holocaust, on the local level, you will find a whole series of elements that are comparable in terms of neighbors killing neighbors. Uh, people have known each other for a long time. The dynamics are not the same. There are many similarities. There are many differences. It is not only social or psychological, it often has to do also with so-called collective memories or what people internalized over long periods of time, but it's not eternal. It's something that you can actually trace back historically. And that tells you things about genocide that otherwise you would not understand when you compare entire genocides of one to the other, and we have a pretty rich literature on that now. Yes, please. Uh, in this vein, I think it's important also to recognize that one effect of comparative studies is to give us an understanding of rescuers. It's very significant that not only in the Holocaust, but in many other cases, you have people making a totally different choice under very difficult circumstances, risking their lives to save others. And I think that this, this is a particularly important idea because uh, it gives us a sense of the choice that many claim is no longer there for them. Uh, I, what, what else could I have done? Well, it, well for, the, for those who are rescuing, that self-understanding is very important. And so when we think about the next 20 years, 30 years, it could be Interesting, a, a member of our group of GPANET, Eyal Myros, suggested to have a global movement of rescuers. Uh, people recognize the fact that, uh, that there is a very important, significant investment of, uh, um, of those who went through the Shoah to recognize the just. is actually an interesting other paradigmatic reference that could be important for other cases in which 
people doing the right things are actually recognized and, uh, and uh, uh, in many ways preserved. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, to be recognized as somebody that's saved is also dangerous. And, uh. Right. That'll be the last comment. In fact, they are in the process of organizing just such a conference uh, next year. Uh, and it won't just be for rescuers, but it will be, in fact, for people from a whole lot of different genocides uh, around the world. And I think it's wonderful that they're doing this. Of course, I love at the age of 66 to see people who are this young <laughs> taking over this movement. So. Thank you. Um, My task now is, is the following. First of all, I, I would like personally to thank Yuda Bauer and Rasegal and all the other organizers of this workshop, which I think was beyond my expectations. I think it was a, a, a truly enlightening experience on various levels, intellectual, moral, scholarly, and also personal, uh, simply in the sense of meeting a group of people, many of whom I did not know before, and I feel that I both learned a great deal and hopefully uh, this group will continue to function in one way or another, both as a group and links between separate people in this group and each other. Um, so thank you so much for this. And now it's my honor to pass the last words to you, the Bauer. Uh, well, I've had my say, say uh, two nights ago, so there's not much point in uh, repeating any of that. I do want to make some uh, comments on the issue itself. What is the purpose of genocide studies? What is the purpose of comparative genocide studies? The purpose is frankly practical. It is to try to possibly establish develop uh, policies that may hopefully be accepted by the decision makers and the politicians of large and small powers in order to try and possibly mitigate, though I don't believe it can prevent, they can prevent, mitigate the uh, catastrophes that we are discussing. Now, uh, one of the ways this is being done, and uh, some of us here are involved in this, is to hopefully create in the future a body of small and middle states at the General Assembly of the United Nations to exert pressure on the Security Council and on alliances of states in order to uh, possibly, again, uh, move this kind of thing forward. And uh, uh, that involves, as Andrea put it uh, before, not this afternoon, but before that, uh, the ownership of this, uh, these policies by those countries that we would like to have involved in that process. There have already been meetings of Latin American, some African, most European countries on the middle level of uh, uh, foreign policy bureaucrats. It's a long haul, take an awful long time. But it is possibly one of the ways in which this can be done unless the academic community produces the kind of data and the kind of comparisons that we were talking about here, this cannot be done. This is what this uh, symposium was about. It was not intended to uh, establish policies. It was not intended to uh, have a public declaration of any kind. It was not intended to create consensus. 
The whole point was to have people with different opinions and uh, diverging opinions uh, to exchange their views, which is what happened. And I think uh, that that is itself a very important thing. I would claim that this is the first time ever that this has happened. We never had in the history of conferences, etc., etc., a symposium of people who actually talk to each other rather than lecture at each other. So I think that this is this is a this is a a first which will hopefully be repeated. The other thing that I would like to say is that uh, uh, comparative genocide is something quite new. We need to develop theoretical and practical concepts of how, to, how exactly to go about it. Because a mechanical comparison between what happened here and what happened there won't lead us very far. We need to, to have the structures, and I think that the work that uh, Barbara and uh, Monty and Greg and others have been doing in, to, uh, to establish some kind of order in all this uh, might well lead us somewhere, but that is only possible by globalization. Globalization in two senses. One is horizontal because all the countries of the world are involved, and I think uh, you examined, what, 195 or 196 countries, or something of that order of magnitude. It's a tremendous job. That is one way. And then the other way is, this is my, my uh, historian's perspective, uh, the vertical uh, globalization. In other words, you need to know what happened before. And when our uh, colleague, the psychologist there said, 10 or 15,000 years ago, how do you know? Because we don't really have evidence before that. But we do have evidence just about at that level. And the evidence would suggest that that was not the first time these things happened. Now, uh, this is very important because then you know what kind of things you try to compare. Now, the, uh, the Rorschach tests on uh, uh, pharaohs uh, yielded more or less the same results as those on contemporary humans. We, the division that we make between ancient, medieval, and modern histories is a total invention. It, 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 it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, we we uh, use the concept of time wrongly. We uh, measure time by our own lifespan. I know this very well because I think I'm the oldest person here around. So, but this is historically a mistake. History doesn't work in human lifespans. It works completely differently. And in order to examine, to, 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 to see the, uh, the to, to compare, you need to uh, work into our, your comparison uh, this change, I would maybe call it a revolutionary change of conceptualization. What the data collections give us is tremendously important. Tremendously important. Without that, we can't move anywhere at all. But as our colleagues who know much more about this than I do will uh, tell all of us, they are at the beginning. They, they, are, they, 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 they are not where they want to be, naturally, because it takes time. Now, I, I really can't talk about it. When I was in high school in Haifa, my mathematics teacher told me, Yehuda, you are a total mathematical idiot. <laughs> so <laughs> leave, leave it off. But you've got a fairly good memory, so remember all the equations by heart, which I did, which is how I got here. <laughs> because otherwise I wouldn't have passed my exams. <laughs> but there are colleagues who do know 
how to work with figures. And then those of us who can't utilize what they find in order to move some hopefully forward. We are living in a, in a world in which the, uh, the reality checks are so important. We talk about comparative genocide. Please let us remember that there's the United States and China and India and Russia and Japan with their interests. I wouldn't call it national interest, maybe, maybe another word would be more appropriate. They work not by morality, they work not by uh, uh, persuasions of this kind or another, they work because they want to guarantee uh, one, their own rule, and B, the uh, economic and political future of the countries they lead. Not recognizing that, not putting ourselves into their shoes, not realizing that we have to satisfy these concerns of theirs, because otherwise they won't be our allies, which is turning the thing round. You don't oppose them because it's hopeless. You want to accommodate them up to a certain point so that on the other points they will be with you. Now that is something we haven't even started doing. And this is something that I would say when we talk about comparative genocide, this is the aim ultimately that we should be able to do that and on the way to that, we need to take the different genocidal situations one by one and all together. Now, uh, from my own perspective, as a scholar of the Holocaust, it's perfectly clear to me that the Holocaust is different from other genocides, but only partly so. And that is a tremendous, uh, tremendously important thing to study because the fact that I say that it is unprecedented, that the structures of the, gen of, of the Holocaust is in some ways different from the structure of any other genocide. But all the, on all the other things, it is parallel to other genocides. In other words, it is comparable. It must be compared. And the comparison is useful, not only of the Holocaust, but of all the other genocides as well. Uh, now, we are using that term genocide. We know it's very problematic because, there, because as I said in my, my address the other night, uh, it's, it's, it's an abstraction from reality. It doesn't really, really reflect the reality. The reality is much more complicated. But let's use that term because it's so important. It, it's, it's a hook on which we can hang our clothes. Now, uh, I don't want to uh, uh, carry on because it'll, it would lead me too far and we have to end. So what I want to say is that my impression, I hope I'm not wrong, was that this, this was successful somewhat beyond our expectation. I'm looking at Raz and <laughs> some of the other people, I think I should recognize them, are from the Hebrew University and the Academy of Science, Zer uh, Sternhell and from uh, the um, uh, Van Leer Institute and Hebrew University, Amos Goldberg. And uh, unfortunately, he got sick. He couldn't come. Benny Neuberger, who from the Open University, where it's the only place in Israel where there is a course of genocide studies. Uh, and uh, Danny Blattman, who was with us, who had to leave, uh, who uh, represented the Hebrew University. He's the, he was the head until... I think last night, uh, the head of the Institute of Contemporary Jury at Hebrew University. And, uh, and of course, my boss, Johanan Friedman, who is the, uh, um, the uh, head of the humanities section of the Academy of uh, Sciences, Israeli Science. It is the Academy who uh, uh, sponsored this and who pushed it, and it's largely his work uh, uh, that this was done. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, participants at the symposium 
And uh, one of the ideas was that this would create a basis for networking in the future. And especially I would like to uh, uh, welcome any disagreements and any uh, disappointments in what happened during the last two days, so maybe we could do it better next time. And uh, uh, the, the whole idea, you see, is that uh, unless you have disagreement in the academic community, you don't get anywhere. <laughs> so what we need to do is to develop this kind of thing. And uh, 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 let me especially thank Ras Segal and Galia Finzi, uh, because uh, they, they really did the uh, symposium from A to Z. <laughs> so, uh, as you would say in your native language, au revoir. Say à la prochaine. Tomorrow, Greg is lecturing at the School of Public Health. You're all invited at 11 o'clock talking about the eight stages for our international students of public health, many of whom are from Mexico. Oh, thank you. Thank you.